You're listening to the Food and Fitness Podcast, the show about all things related to food and fitness. Follow the show on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at food.fitnesspodcast. We're your hosts. I'm Jackie Vandertoon. I'm Jessica White. And I'm Dave Marshall. I am so excited because on today's episode, we're joined by Amanda Stockley Hall. Amanda is a certified athletic therapist with a master's degree in rehabilitative science, and she's here to share us some information and tell us about her journey to health. She's a former varsity athlete who's dedicated her life to helping active individuals maintain an active lifestyle through the assessment and management of their injuries. Amanda has traveled extensively as the head athletic therapist for Field Hockey Canada, as well as being part of the core medical team for a variety of games, such as Pan Am, Canada Games, Invictus Games, Indigenous Games, to name but a few. Um, Amanda, you've done a lot of stuff Um, because I was reflecting on all the things you've done. Have I missed anything important about your career that you want to share? Oh, my. There's honestly, I have done a lot of stuff now that I come to think of it. You know, um, I I am also a yoga instructor. And I also do um, workshops for women in health and wellness. When I was working, that was something else that I did as my own personal job. Like I held retreats and stuff like that. So I think that's about it. I'm sure some other things will come up, but yeah. Amanda, one of the wonderful things that I love about you, and I've really had the pleasure of working with Amanda at Sheridan College, um, and she's super passionate. And I I wish that I could write it out and just capitalize the letters because that is Amanda. Um, She is super dedicated to everything that she does. Um, However, she's had to have a little bit of a different journey within the last couple of years. Um, Can you share your story of moving from a healthy, active individual with a thriving athletic therapy practice and instructor at Sheridan College, which to where you are today? Yeah, and uh, it has been quite a journey, I'm telling you. So um, it probably started in about 2016. Um, I I originally noticed some numbness in my hand and I had come back from my friends and just felt like a respiratory issue coming on, but it was also accompanied with a massive amount of fatigue. And um, at first they thought I was throwing a blood clot because I had had surgery a few months earlier, Um, but it just ended up going through, 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 through. And as you know, Jackie, I work like a, a maniac. So in 2017, um, I had all of those games all at one time. So within one year, we had really covered everything. And the Invictus games were the sort of, the, were supposed to be the culmination for me, but then I ended up having to go to Guyana. And so it was just a crazy field hockey Canada, like crazy at work, crazy year. Um, And as that was happening, my symptoms were just getting worse. I kept progressing. It got to the point where I was slurring my words. Um, It became really hard to um, type because the automatic nature of typing, I was typing the wrong things onto the screen because my nervous system was shutting down. Um, And so I was still working a 60-hour work week and trying to get all of these tests done and just feeling quite rotten and things just progressively got worse and worse and worse. And so it ended up that in 2019, I was at work actually when it started happening and uh, I ended up having a seizure Mm -hmm. Um, that kind of put me in the hospital. So yeah, we know that it's autoimmune in nature because my immune system is shutting down. Like I'm, so many different autoimmune issues right now. Um, But there's also this underlying neurological condition because after I came out of the hospital, I wasn't able to walk. So without medication, I kind of look like I have Parkinson's because my body constantly has to move to correct and my balance is off. Um, I can't really walk properly. And I have a lot of vascular issues because my autonomic nervous system, which controls your breathing, your fight or flight is being heavily impacted. So 
yeah, that's where I was at that. And now I'm at home. <laughs> Most days I get out of bed and do stuff. But yeah, I went from having a very busy, active, physically active life as well to not really being able to move. Yeah. And I, and I, and I totally like when Amanda says she works 60 hours a week, um, that's actually not a surprise to me whatsoever because Amanda, you're really involved Mm -hmm. in field hockey Canada. And when Amanda dives into stuff, she dives in head first and the feet are right behind her. So, uh, there's a whole bunch of juggling things that, that have gone into the air. Amanda, can I ask you, cause I remembered asking you if they had a, a diagnosis for this, if you don't mind me asking, yeah. have they come up with a diagnosis yet? No, but this is part of the problem that we are dealing with. Like some of these issues, we know that the neuro, well, we don't know. There's a suspicion that the neurological issues are some of them are functional. I do have lesions in my brain and I have inflammation in my brain, which we've been able to show through um, lumbar puncture. But the problem is some of the symptoms that I have are not corresponding to the lesions. So it could be because of inflammation, but we're not really sure and we don't really know. And so right now I'm under the care of the lupus clinic in Toronto. So we're, I don't know, we're just, we're, there's so many pieces. And the problem is with COVID and also Canadian healthcare is that if a doctor says, ooh, you don't fit this perfectly, I want you to go see this person just to rule these things out. That simple act is six months longer where you get no treatment, right? And so sometimes I have doctors who are like, okay, I I know you've already seen a neurologist, but I want you to see this neurologist and this endocrinologist and this, and it's like, so you're looking at maybe a year, a year plus before they'll have enough information to pull it all together. And I have been tested a lot but they haven't even started scratching the surface of what they could potentially test for. Super yeah. frustrating. It Super is. Frustrating. Now, if I can ask, with your background and your knowledge and your education, um, do you find that a tool or um, a difficulty when it comes to that? Because the language that you've just been using, you've said we a lot of the time, um, which a lot of patients may not necessarily use that kind of language. Mm-hmm. So. With your education and your your knowledge, do you find that more of a, a, a an easier thing or a more difficult thing to do when you're working with um, physicians in, in this process? Okay, I'm going to tread lightly here when I answer this. I think one of the things that's been helpful for me is as a practitioner, as Jackie would know, we, you ha- we teach you, students the language of how you speak to physicians, especially when writing notes right? So if you're trying to get something, there's a specific way that you can ask for it, where it won't put your put the doctor off. We do have to remember that the medical field is diverse. And there's a lot of people who use maybe differing language than you do. But that I feel sometimes I know what to ask and how to ask it. But I also feel when you ask those direct questions, it puts the physicians back up. And so I think that, that that's where I'm saying it's a bit dicey because they know that I know my information. So when they're trying to tell me something and I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't exactly fit, does it? And they're like, ooh. Now, granted, I have some really, I would say that only happens with doctors. And these are people that you don't really get an opportunity to build a relationship with. It's not my family doctor. I, it's like a person I've seen for 30 seconds or maybe just talk to on the phone. I also tend to be a bit direct and I'm getting low on patients. But my, help, my therapists are all fantastic. There's, it works better when I'm dealing with a therapist because we work in conjunction, right? Yeah, I think that's, uh, that's definitely got to be something um, that might be a little bit harder, especially for those who have a knowledge of kind of the industry or maybe knows which alley to go down when doing research that uh, the regular person may not. So, I mean, I, I a hundred percent respect you uh, in those things when you have those challenges. And I think that was probably the right answer. Uh, and I could probably see how you would feel those, uh, 
those things when you're talking to different people. And especially, you know, if you bring up a, a nugget and all of a sudden they get super kind of worried about it. Right. So, yeah, yeah. I actually had a neurologist when I brought a paper in for him and I was like, I feel like we need to consider this and here's some information. He gave me the eye roll, but then checked the source. And I was like, yeah, I'm not just going to print something off Google. Come on, <laughs> give me a, give me, he's like, this is actually a good article. I'm like, you're welcome. <laughs> I, I wrote this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> it's, awesome. it's real research, you know. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you mentioned that um, you have a, that you, you teach yoga. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about how you've discovered yoga and um, why you decided to become a yoga instructor and why it saved your life? Well, yeah. So I discovered yoga my, one of my best friends growing up her name's joshna maharaj you might know her dave she's like a food activist she's amazing she just wrote a book this year i'm just giving her a shameful plug since it's a food broad broadcast right <laughs> so she's been my best friend since grade seven and she's uh, hindu so there was a lot of spiritual practices in and around her house then i was always very interested in the spirituality of the people who um, had different faiths than I did at the time when I was a kid growing up. And so um, from at her house, her dad had an altar there and he would tell me the stories about the different gods and goddesses. Um, I got to meet uh, Swamiji, who was amazing and blessed me and gave me blessed coins when I was 12. And so those little things just impact you, right? And so when I was at university, I obviously, my, my major was in kinesiology but I minored in religion and culture. <laughs> Things that people don't know about me. I, I, I know I can also play the trombone, but that's like another thing. <laughs> I cannot play the trombone. I tried <laughs> grade seven and eight. Terrible. I love it, man. It is so good. That Wawa on the end just adds some richness. Well, side sidebar, but um, yeah, I've always had a lot of interest in um, religion and culture. And so through that course, I actually got to examine um, and I read the Bhagavad Gita, which is like the Hin loosely like the Hindu Bible. And so this was always just something that interested me. And I started practicing yoga probably when I was in university. And yeah, it's just something I always did. And it was like a moving meditation for me. I loved it. And um, as of becoming an athletic therapist, I found I was using it quite a bit with my patients. And so I was like, I can't keep giving them these things to do without knowing the full reasoning behind these poses. Like I'm not honoring the craft here. So that's why I decided to get do my yoga certification also right in the middle of 2017 when I was already sick because <laughs> I love to put pressure on myself. Um, but I also thought it would be something that was I, I, when I was in Guyana, I actually had this sort of revelation and you guys would like this because um, I wasn't feeling the best, but I was there with my team. And I had a book called The Desire Map that's written by this lady, Danielle Laporte. And I read that book a long time ago, but it has a workbook in the back. And I was like, ah, I'm doing a workbook. Blah. So I just did it. For some reason, I packed this and only this book to bring with me when I was with my team. And so it was like the perfect sort of setup. Like every morning I was getting up and I was practicing yoga. But what was happening is that the girls wanted to practice with me. And then the men's team wanted to practice with me. And then the referees wanted to practice. So I ended up with this massive, like, one week yoga practice. And every day we were eating fresh food, coconut water, just like I was going to bed early, waking up early. And I felt awesome. And I finished the end of that book. And the purpose of that book is to help you to find out how you want to feel. And I didn't realize that I had such difficulty with actually saying what I want, which is probably why I did all the things. Because I never stopped to ask myself what I wanted in the first place. 
you, it sounds ridiculous coming out of my mouth now, but I know so many people who are in that exact situation. So when I facilitate retreats, I often use Danielle Laporte's work to help people get to the point where they even know what they want. Everybody can tell you what they don't want. They just can't tell you what they want. And what happened after Guyana, the Sunday when I came home from Guyana, I got a call from the yoga studio in town who had originally told me they didn't have space for me. The woman just called and said, I have a really good feeling about this. And she's like, I really want you to come. I know I told you there no, there's no space. Nobody dropped out. I'm just going to add an extra spot for you. And yeah, if I hadn't have learned those lessons through the yoga practice when I was going through some, some of my hardest times, but at the same time, every month I was in the studio, I was in my practice. And it, it helped me so much. And when I'm, when I, when I got sick anyway, is because, you know, you can, you can only be the frog in the boiling water for so much. Yoga helps to turn the temperature down, but when the, the pot's already at 99, <laughs> you know, that's how that goes. So after I got sick, one of the very first things I was like, I, I want to practice, right? Because yoga is a lifestyle for me. And I just started with my breath work. I had a lot of neurological firing, misfiring in my diaphragm. I still have that, which you guys are lucky because sometimes I can't talk properly because I can't control the air. But I think one of the things that was su super duper helpful before I could do anything, I just go sit on my mat and do breath work, right? Because I could still breathe. And that blossomed into every day just going and showing up for myself on the mat, whether it was just to meditate or it was to move or meditate and move every single day. You just got to build that practice and that's where it changes your life, right? It's the constant movement and inward reflection that helps to open you up and helps you to discover things that you didn't know were there. I, I love it, Amanda. I mean, I, I see you the kind of this binary and I don't want to call it chaos, but you know, you had so many things going to going to the polar opposite of the spectrum and yeah. having to focus on the small things like breathing, yes. like centering yourself. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. I was lucky that I had been exposed to that practice early. I grew up in the church. And so prayer has always been a part of my life. But I am, I feel like I'm more of more less than I'm going to sit in the pews and pray. I'm more of a, I'm going to have conversations with God. But I'm also deeply spiritual because my family is as well. And so I've always had this little witchy side to me, you know, I always make spells and leave them in jars around places and, you know, burn herbs when sprinkle rum in people's houses when they move. Like Jamaicans have so many interesting customs <laughs> that I just adopt, adopted. And so I knew from taking the yoga teacher training that I had the tools to work on myself. Because part of the reason I was so busy was because I was in dysfunction. The busyness was covering trauma, it was a mask, trauma mask. And whether you want to say it's physical trauma or nobody escapes childhood unscathed, you know, or whether it's trauma that had recently happened in relationships or whatever, Normally, you'll see people's trauma response in a situation, and sometimes they can't turn it off. Like, how many of you guys saw on social media when COVID happened, everybody hit the road into sourdough country, or Mary Kondo country, or some other, I'm going to do this and you're going to listen to me, and now I'm like, it was insane. It went from cat pictures to maniacal everyday posting sourdough pictures. And that wasn't because people 
you know, really just wanted the time off that they felt relaxed and comfortable. So let's bake a lot of sourdough. It could be, there might've been somebody, some people who just discovered something new because they had some time. But I know that you guys know what I mean, that it was like trending at one point, you know, mm -hmm. and everybody had to get on it because people don't like to be with themselves. And yoga help, helps you to learn how to be with yourself. Then you helps you to clear up, sweep away. When the things come to the surface, you have a, a way to deal with them now, right? Mm -hmm. So that's it. That that's the real, really the way that it is. I have brought in my spiritual practice, which is fantastic, um, and not just necessarily in Hinduism and yoga, uh, as much as I love that and I, I practice it often. Um, I also study African spirituality as well, which is very closely linked to yoga, especially when we're talking about Egyptian stuff. So um, yeah, there's, there's more spells to come. Let's just say that. <laughs> My poor kids. That was so inspiring. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> the only part I'm remembering is sprinkling rum. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's like, to ca cast out the evil spirits. You sprinkle rum in the corners of the room. Maybe that's why I feel good all, on a regular basis. <laughs> yes. Sprinkling to myself. Yeah, just sprinkle it on every corner of your body. Yeah. Exercise those demons. <laughs> I just figured go to the inside, let it sprinkle from there. <laughs> that's, I'll let it come yeah. up my pores. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's perfect. Yeah, so that's pretty much how it has been. And it's been fantastic. I mean, I do think that people get better results when yoga becomes a lifestyle, right? It's something that you you realize that practicing asana, which is practice on your mat, like the poses and stuff, that's only one of eight limbs of yoga, right? That's only one thing that you do. There's seven other things that you can do. And I had to keep reminding myself that this is my, this is my yoga. My friend, Lindsay Vanderhoek has a business called discover your yoga. And I didn't quite understand why she named her business that until this year. And I realized that my yoga has changed and modified and everybody's yoga is their yoga. And your purpose is to discover your yoga. And I love that name now. That's awesome. I actually didn't realize that there was eight different strands mm -hmm. or um, limbs or what, what do you call it? Yeah, well, they're called well, the eight limbs of yoga. Eight limbs. Yeah. yeah, I had no idea. I only, I, when I think of yoga, I think of a mat and yes. doing that. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. so the breathing, the breath work, that's different, different limb. Oh, okay. Still yoga, but yeah. just a little bit different. So <laughs> I feel like that's where when you understand something for the way it was supposed to be um, delivered, because if you go to a place and you're doing an online yoga class, that's, uh, you know, over a weekend or something, are you learning really what yoga is about? Because that's yoga comes to save you when you realize what yoga is really about, right? If you just think it's about poses and you can't do those poses, then all of a sudden yoga has gone for you. Meanwhile, it's just such a tiny sliver that you can still have a very robust practice without being able to move your body. Mm. Right? And so like they the in yoga, there's the eight limbs, but then there's also sort of like what some Christian people would call the 10 commandments. So the, the, the yamas and the niyamas and the niyamas and the yamas are, like I kind of loosely describe them as how to think and how to be right. And even just practicing those things, you can dive into what yoga really means to you. And so, yes, I feel very blessed that I've discovered my yoga, not just yoga that I make for other people in a class, but really what, soothe me. I think that's with a lot of things where there's kind of that the surface 
um, that's being represented maybe more to pulp culture. Mm -hmm. uh, but the deeper you get into it, there's a, a, a deeper understanding. Uh, and it, like you mentioned, um, you know, like yoga, Christianity, food, fitness, you know, there's, you know, you can see something just on Instagram and like, okay, this is how you make uh, sourdough, but there's so much more that goes into it uh, on everything. And I think a lot of people may not have the patience to dive deeper into it. And I think yeah. that's, that's something that has to be learned. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not taught, but it has to be learned, which I think is two separate things when yeah. it comes to that. Yeah. I think, I mean, if you start kids when they're really young with stillness, you know, and with breath work practice, I do that with both of my kids. Now, Carter will practice a little yoga. Wesley, he kind of sort of does, but not really, right? But he meditates. So I'll take that for him. So they each kind of take a little chunk of it and they start to learn that it is okay to do nothing. It is okay to be with your thoughts. In fact, it's actually time for you to let those things come up and then let them pass. Letting them pass is how you sleep at night. So we need to teach the kids. Yes, it's okay for it to come into your awareness, but now you need to let that go. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, I think that's an important practice that you can learn, but it does help when you're a little bit younger, but at the same time, like everybody can take that five minutes to themselves, but it's so hard. If honestly, people don't do it. I did. I used to do it, but my problem was there was nothing going to save me from the fact that my pot was on fire. Right. So as much as I had these practices in my life previously, the, the way that I have changed who I am has come through the yoga, right? Has come through the illness. So um, before we were talking about how you work 60 hours a week and you were a source of uh, knowledge for a lot of people and you've had this change that's been going on. So now that you are becoming kind of the person who's trying to soak in all the knowledge from all of your doctors and your physicians and those you're partnering with, how has that transition um, affected you? And maybe are you finding a different way for you to become the source of knowledge for someone else in a new way? You know what? I never really thought of it um, in the way that I like, I wasn't trying to replace work. It was actually really hard for me because I had to shut down my Instagram of my own business. And that's where I kind of um, work is such a huge comfort to me, right? Like it was um, a way of knowing how to protect myself. It was a way of feeling confident uh, in myself and my skills. So I feel like it has been when I speak to doctors and they give me the respect that I deserve, right? It makes me feel like, wow, that I'm utilizing some of my skills from my past, obviously. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't think they, I don't think a lot of them speak to everybody that way. That's a common complaint. Right. And then if I think about posting, like I, I post my story and what I've been going through because it's cathartic for me. And I also want to warn people, right? It was not about trying to work or create a connection. It was more like, this is my story and I'm trying to just get it out of me, right? And can I ask, can I ask a minute, sorry, um, what do you mean by warn people? Like warn people about? Overworking. Okay. Uh, warn people about the busyness, right? And why, why are you like trying to get people to introspect a little bit? And we talk, Jackie knows that I studied self-reflection as a therapist and I built courses that involved self-reflection, but self-reflection is a huge piece of what I do and did as a practitioner. And also it's been a huge piece of me understanding where I am in this journey at this time. So I would love people to just take a little bit of time for themselves and ask whether, like, just to honestly 
when you are choosing something to do, are you choosing it powerfully? Or are you just going with the flow because, oh, it's Bob's birthday. Oh, and I got to go. You know? No, no. Choose powerfully. Like, if you're going to go, say, I'm going for these reasons. Poor Bob. If, you, know what I, you know what I mean? Or just don't go. And just be okay with it. Be like, bye, Bob. Here's your gift card. <laughs> <laughs> We don't allow ourselves that opportunity because society tells us we have to go along with and be pleasing of. And, and a lot of times we sacrifice ourselves in order to help everybody else. Now, I know for a fact that I loved my, I loved my career and I loved all the people that I was able to help, but I, it did come at a sacrifice to myself for sure. A hundred percent. Amanda, I, you and I are both passionate about health and Listening to you now, I think I know kind of the answer to this question, but I'm super curious uh, because we often look at health as being very one dimensional. You have knee pain, therefore it must be biological in nature, and I'm going to fix the biology about why you have the knee pain. But you talk about, or you've mentioned that you believe that health is actually three dimensional. Mm -hmm. And can you elaborate on that and why health? Um, has three dimensions. So the way I think about it is like, if we look at health and w the way it's been defined by other people, we have this biopsychosocial version of health, right? And so physical stuff, like you were talking about, your knee hurts, let's take care of that. You've had a heart attack, let's put this stunt in or stint in. Um, then you have mental health, right? Like we all know that that's big and blossoming. And then they talk about the social aspect of things too, because it heavily influences the other stuff, right? So if we put biopsychosocial in this, it pretty much covers healthcare and everything as we know it, right? But then you look at things like meditation, for example. You look at things like Reiki or acupuncture, right? Those things kind of exist in this other space Right. I still think they are they should be part of our biopsychosocial model, but they aren't really. And I think that we need to leave space for the meta metaphysical. Right. That is and I, I know people might I might lose people here, but there's the three realms that we know is the biopsychosocial, the metaphysical, which science doesn't necessarily understand. And then there's a whole other realm of everything that we don't know yet, <laughs> right? There's a whole other realm. And I feel like doctors and therapists don't take the time to explain to people that they, you could be falling in the realm of that we don't know yet. We have to think the MRI, MRI is what diagnoses MS now, right? But prior to the arrival of the MRI in the 70s, People called MS something different and made it into a mental health disorder. So people who had MS didn't get the care that they needed and ended up dying. It was quite a, a deadly disease before the arrival of the MRI. That whole dimension of I don't know is what makes people do research. <laughs> but too many doctors, too many therapists, want to make sure that the person fits in the biopsychosocial. social you gotta fit in this box <laughs> you know and then they denounce the metaphysical which that's people's entire spiritual practice and for me although i'm not physically getting better because they can't treat the thing i have yet i have improved in this metaphysical state could you call that mental health yeah, but I'm talking about a spiritual practice, right? So it's not really mental health. We can't really drag it over there. It exists in story, right? It's metaphysical. I love it. I think you've blown some people's minds. <laughs> um, but I love the fact that, you know, your health or your fitness, I'll call it as well, mm -hmm. is more than just the knee pain. 100 percent you know whatever and i think it's really important as patients because we're all going to be patients or we all are patients at some point 
that we look at a little bit deeper. You know, maybe uh, the spade is a spade. Maybe the knee pain is the knee pain because you sprained a ligament. Mm-hmm. Maybe the knee pain is something different. So self-reflection. You self-reflection. Know, what you're trying to maybe cover or do. Oh, I, Amanda, you and I could talk about this for hours, but you have brought up like I'm, I'm on fire <laughs> right now. Yeah. I feel like as I've started to explore neurology and as I've started to explore um, how much we actually know of the brain in the biopsychosocial realm, and that includes mental health as well, we're actually really, 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 really small amounts of data when Mm -hmm. you really, really consider it. And so when they tell me, oh, some of your symptoms might be functional, I'm like, oh, this is interesting. What does that mean? It means my brain isn't communicating properly with my body. They think it could be because of the inflammation. We don't really know. But there are entire realm of people that fall into functional neurological disorders where their brain simply will not communicate properly with their body. And it, anything that your brain controls in your body, which is everything, can go wrong. And there's no help. No, they receive very little help. And it's extremely debilitating. People can be functionally blind where they cannot see a thing, but there's nothing to treat. It just, the electrical signal's not working. It's misfiring. And so it's a very popular area of neurology, but nobody's studying it. It's very small funding. So when I started to learn about this, I was like, wow, how many times have I told someone who didn't, that I treated, that I wasn't getting better. And I just was like, oh my God, there's, it's crazy. Oh my God. They're just, they just really want to come and hang out with me because (laughs) there's nothing wrong with this cat. As a therapist, I've done it. And you're just like, wow. Amanda, we've all done it. We've We've all all done it. I'm going to put myself out there and say, yeah. Meanwhile, there's this whole realm in that third dimension. Skip over the spirituality and metaphysical dimension and just go into the land of we don't know yet. And those people's entire disability exists in the land of we don't know. And it could be functional knee pain. It could be functional shoulder pain. And we have to allow ourselves to understand that that exists. Mm -hmm. And we also have to be okay with there are limitations to medicine and to science. We're limited, (laughs) right? We're very, very limited. So you have to, as a patient, be okay with Maybe your doctor doesn't know the answer. And this does not mean that you run to the next snake oil person either, because in the realm of the metaphysical, there's great. And then there's awful, just like in any realm. So you have to be able to do your work. And for me, it has been great to play in the land of we don't know yet. And to play in this metaphysical land. Because this biopsychosocial is not something that I can influence right now. Mm -hmm. Right? I think you're the first person I've ever heard say, oh, I just started looking into neurology. (laughs) I love that. Like, that's just like something you're going to look into it now. Yeah. I'm like, I can't feel my leg. I'm going to go do some some research. (laughs) Because you don't have instant accessibility to these people. When they see you, they want to talk fast. I have one of my neurologists and our appointments are like an hour and 15 minutes. And he's always like, I should have discharged you a long time ago, but I'm like, I know you just can't do it because I'm your favorite. (laughs) We're going to solve the answers of all the mysterious things right now. (laughs) Yeah. It's been fun. It's been fun learning about that stuff for sure. And I feel you so much because I'm going through like a similar but completely different thing. Um, Obviously, I don't have neurological unknowns, but I have gut health unknowns. Um, And I just feel like every doctor you go to, um, you know, you have to explain your story over and over and over again. And it it gets tiring and exhausting. And, um, you know, there's there is a lot of frustration with our healthcare system, because not everything is linear. There isn't always an answer. There's so much unknowns. And I'm I'm definitely in that 
in that box of unknown. Um, so can you describe some of your frustrations that you've had with the medical system and how are you managing those frustrations? Well, I used to get really frustrated in the beginning, right? Because this has been since 2016. So also my, I feel like my personality has shifted a little bit as well because I just didn't have time for all the extra stuff. I'm like assertive. So I'm like, give me the answers. Like, and they weren't coming. And that was super frustrating. And as someone who's in the medical field, of course, I do have access to research. You're checking out what these symptoms are. You're checking out these types of things. But then you're like, I feel like I'm the cruise director of my own issue here. Like, I need to back up too. I need to stop like guiding the ship because sometimes it's just my personality and the doctor's like, yeah, you know what? That's a great idea because I can sell stuff. But maybe if I had kept my mouth shut, they would have gone in a different direction. So I think it's just frustrating because healthcare as it is right now exists in silos. My neurologist and my rheumatologist do not talk. They send like little quick messages through this electronic system and things can get missed. Things get missed and things don't get addressed properly. And like I said, it's six months and then six months. And if your symptoms change in those six months or develop, it just complicates things and turns you off on another crazy tangent. So one of the things that I found that was super helpful was um, seeking the care of a functional medicine doctor. So mine is a naturopathic doctor, but there are a lot of MDs, medical doctors, that are functional medicine doctors. So they look at your, like everything. They're going to take your poop samples. They're going to take blood work. They're going to be looking for antibodies that other people aren't looking for right now. They are limited with what they can order if they're a naturopathic doctor, but if they're an MD, they can literally order any test under the sun. And so sometimes when you seek the care of a naturopathic practitioner, they are looking at the entire biopsychosocial. Whereas you know that like it is hilarious when you have a rheumatologist say, oh, have you tried meditation? And you're like, have you tried meditation? <laughs> Don't tell me to do something you haven't done yourself. Like, come on, I'm, get on the same page with me. It's cute. I'd rather them ask if you've tried it and try and dabble into that mental health or take a little side step as opposed to pretending that doesn't even exist. Because sometimes meditation helps a lot of different people with a lot of different ailments. So I'd rather have a doctor, as much as I'm making fun of them, I'd rather have them suggest some of these things. But honestly, what I, my biggest message, I want these doctors doing these things. Because when you've done it yourself, then you can turn around and ask, tell a patient, listen, I know you're in the realm of the, we don't know yet, but here are some tools that are going to help you navigate that spot of unknown. Like you can get really uncomfortable, hence the sourdough, hence the perfectly organized closet everyone was taking pictures of. You can get really uncomfortable with the unknown. So you start doing all the busy work. Meanwhile, your doctors and your healthcare practitioners, especially since they know that they work in silos, if they would just individually make some space for functional medicine, make some space for meditation, breath work, maybe acupuncture, right? I feel like they need to be a little bit more holistic in their approach because there are many avenues to healing. Mm -hmm. There are. And so my advice, that would be my advice to you if you were in this situation, because for me, obviously do your research, make sure you're looking and finding great people, you know, but as a health care practitioner, it's great to have these people in your back pocket as well. Because when you start to get to the, I don't know, instead of letting your ego continue to treat that person, you need to make a referral. And the way that you build your referral base is by maybe going and speaking and having some of these treatments done for yourself and seeing if they did anything, right? 
the funniest thing, my husband, considering that I'm a therapist, he doesn't necessarily ask for treatment a lot. And, you know, he didn't want to go for a massage. He was feeling weird about his like body or whatever, who knows. And I said, why don't you go to the reflexologist? They're right down the street in the massage clinic. And he was like, I'm like, yeah, they just work on your feet. And he was like, okay. So he went and he swears by it. He's like, that is the best treatment I've ever had. I did not have to get undressed and get massaged. I just feel so relaxed. I feel completely balanced. And my husband's not woo-woo at all. But if you ask him, would you like to have a full body massage or some reflexology? He's taken the reflexology. We have to make space for those things. Mm -hmm. I've had reflexology done twice now and I swear by it too. It's, I, I don't, I don't like people touch, yeah. touching my back or anything, but yeah, the, I, I went in not knowing what to expect and I came out being like, wow, this is absolutely amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like that's where, you know, that's where the frustration comes in is that I hear so many stories from people who say, oh my gosh, that I had a great experience with reflexology or I had a great experience with Reiki. And I don't want to, I cannot, this is where 3D healing comes from because knowing who I am as a person, I can't tell them that that's fake. There's no evidence to suggest that it's fake. And there's a lot of thousands of years of practice to suggest that it works. Mm -hmm. And now I don't need to prescribe them saying, I swear by Reiki, go get it done by this practitioner. But I can bring it up saying, hey, have you considered this might help with some of the things that you're going on? If not, it might even just help you manage the situation that you're in. And that's been a huge thing for me is just like, um, when I start twitching, as you can probably see a little bit, and when I have symptoms that get worse, I utilize those resources to help me manage where I'm at, right? It just takes you off the ledge a little bit. So, uh, sorry, Dave, I'll be, right, I'll be right back. You guys continue without me. I just have to help my little guy. <laughs> no problem. No problem. So uh, earlier you mentioned that you were a varsity athlete. So first question was, um, what was your sport, uh, sport or sports of choice? And uh, kind of how did your transition go from um, being fully active and participating so much uh, in clinics to being in your position now? Because you said your attitude changed. So I'm guessing that had a lot to do with it. So maybe you can just share how that, how that challenge ha or how that change happened and how you kind of got over that mountain. Well, um, I played rugby and so, um, I got like at the time our team was just starting at Laurier. We were playing everywhere. We were trying to get that varsity status at the time we weren't varsity, but we were, I can't even remember what they called it. And you had to play in this league for like a year before you could go into varsity. So it was really um, very challenging. I started working with teams at university. So not only was I playing, but I also worked with the men's rugby team. I worked with the women's hockey team. And so, uh, and I also worked at the bar on campus. So I had this very, very busy, busy, busy lifestyle, like from high school. This was something I used to do also in high school. <laughs> Probably went further than that, by the way that we, you talked yes. about your busy life. Yeah, it's true. I am a busy, was a busy person my entire life. And so um, really what it was, there was a book that I read after I got sick when I was in the hospital for the first time. It's written by Dr. Uh, Gabor Mate, M-A-T-E. Um, he's Canadian, French Canadian. Um, actually, he's not French Canadian, but he lives in Quebec. And it's an amazing book called When the Body Says No. And it's about, uh, basically, he used his research to map the psychological profiles of certain illnesses, right? So he mapped a psychological profile for autoimmune stuff, MS, that type of stuff. stuff. He mapped it out for heart attack. He mapped it out for breast cancer. He mapped it out. And there was very distinctive links. And his whole 
um, not his whole, like he studies trauma and talks about how different types of trauma impact the body. And in this book, he talks about how it manifests as disease. And so I felt like that was just so interesting to me. And I started to dig in with my therapist to be like, why have I always been this busy? What has been going on in my life that caused me to be this busy? And even with varsity, you say with athletics, I broke my arm on the rugby field at McMaster. And they set my arm there. I was in a cast. I ended up being in a cast for six months because it would, my bone, it wouldn't heal. Um, I was still working at the bar. I just got them to cast my hand like this so I could carry a waitress tray. Of <laughs> course I, you would. Because uh, I, could, I couldn't pour a draft beer. Like you need to be able to turn your, and my arm was like this. So I was like, I'll waitress instead. Get, I'm fine. <laughs> and I still worked with my team. But they gave me a sidekick to do some stuff that I couldn't do. But I was still on the bench. Ridiculous. I broke through my cast three times. It's no surprise that my arm didn't heal. So right after university, I ended up having to have um, reconstructive surgery of my arm. And they put in a steel plate and screws and everything. And so after... I was rehabilitating from that and got better that summer. I was looking for something to do and I worked at the Brampton center for sports and entertainment, the power eight center slinging beers once again. <laughs> and um, one of my old friends that I served drinks to was like, can you come and work with our team Brampton Excelsiors? And I was like, yeah, yeah. So I went and worked with the junior guys and then they were like, we need the seniors and there was nobody there. So I did two teams of course. So I went from playing rugby, you drive into the Brampton center. And if you turn left, you go to the rugby pitch. If you turn right, I'd go to work or to lacrosse. So it felt so normal for me. I really just transferred not being able to play my sport into therapy. Right. So to me, mentally, it kind of felt the same. I was still part of the team in the same way. I was going to the arena or going it was it was satisfying all those needs and um you know really I had to take a hard look at my life because autoimmune disorders after reading Dr. Gabor's book I was like well there you go something triggered this now truth be told I did have a massive infection after my surgery and that could have been the catalyst considering it happened a few months before, but we have to think if that happened, that's trauma. So how did mm -hmm. that trauma turn into or trigger my immune system? It's funny because I can actually pinpoint the moment where I, like I had trauma of like food poisoning, which triggered my type one diabetes. Like I can narrow it down to the day. Yeah. Um, which for me is bizarre. So I, I kind of know where you're coming from. And I know um, when, where you have that feeling of still being part of the team in a larger picture mm -hmm. and still felt comfortable, even though your position was different, not necessarily your position on the field, but your position in the team. And it still has the same feeling, um, you know, even though you're doing something a little bit differently. Which is why I never gave it up, even though I was working at Sheridan. That's why I worked mm -hmm. for Field Hockey Canada. Um, because, and before Field Hockey Canada, I was working lacrosse, right? So I constantly had this as part of my life. Like I was seven months pregnant on a lacrosse bench when we won one championship. Like, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Like I couldn't even bend over at the end of the time there to wipe the sweat off the floor. I'd have to ask the refs to do it for me. I'm like, come on guys, I'm so pregnant. Can you help me? <laughs> never questioning why I was actually so pregnant and still at lacrosse at 40 degrees in the arena. Oh my God. But now when I look back at it, that's what I'm saying. My whole personality has shifted because after reading that book and realizing I was addicted to the adrenaline of that much work because it comes with so little sleep and, you know, denying yourself food or you're running from here to there and you're just like so busy and, Anybody wants to talk to you, you're like, oh my God, I'm so busy. And I'm also so busy and I'm trying to breastfeed and type my master's stuff at the same time. 
but also had to cloth diaper my babies and also grew a garden to make their ba- baby food. Like, it was excessive. Forget- Everything you're saying is just like, oh, of, course. of course. Why wouldn't she? Makes complete sense for her. <laughs> it totally does. And one of the biggest regrets that I have, and I had to come face to face with this, is that working at a college, people, my students looked at my lifestyle and thought it was cool and or thought it was something to emulate. And I want, I want all of them to know that I did them a disservice in showing them that. Amanda, one of my favorite stories, it's called Soldier in a Hole. And uh, Google Soldier in a Hole, it really is, it, it speaks to me a lot. The quick and dirty of the, the story is there's a sol- soldier in a hole and he suffers from PTSD. So it's a metaphor. And people walk by of different professions and he says, you know, help me get out of this hole. And they give them some temporary things, but he never gets out of the hole. And then one day soldier jumps in the hole and he's like, what are you doing? Like, how are you going to help me get out of the hole when you're in the hole? And he says, I've been here before. I know how to get out. You mentioned earlier about a warning and you mentioned it again about and you've been doing a disservice to the students. Can you relate? Like, is this kind of where your path of life is going at this point? Well, you know, I'm not sure where my life is going because sometimes, like I said, I can't function at all. It's so random and I haven't quite figured out what my triggers are 100% to know how to avoid them. And having the kids at home was really hard too because it was multiple sensory overload situations happening and no way out of it, right? So I'm not really sure where my life is going, but I know that the students who have reached out to me to tell me that what I've written in Instagram or whatever really resonated with them. And I've had so many of them do this. And then I did a podcast and Nicole, my former coworker, took it to play in her class because she's like, I don't even know how to say what you said, but I want them to hear this and they need to know this. And so when she did that, I was like, oh, okay, well, yeah. And then when you asked me, Jackie, I was like, yeah, you know what? I think if any of the students listen to this or any student, any healthcare person, any person actually, because this isn't unique behavior to me. There's a lot of people who have work as a, it's almost like an addiction. And you look at that adrenaline rush that you get. And one of my best attributes prior to becoming sick was being able to be in very difficult situations and not increase in temperature. And that was my yoga practice. That was my meditation practice. If there was like a chaotic, like, I just remember being at the Canada summer games with my friend Tina, who went through school with me. And there was a massive pileup of these um, cyclists in the triathlon. And there was 14 of them. And we got it on the radio. Everyone's freaking out. They're bringing in the bodies. <laughs> They're just like road rash everywhere. The doctor who was in there was freaking out. Everyone was freaking out because the doctor, that wasn't really his specialty. He's like some normal doctor, not emergency. So Tina and I just were like, everybody out of here. And so we just her and I, we were like, it. she was handling these things and I'm triaging this and we're like, ur, ur, this is how you do it. And so I love the fact that if there was a situation like that, that I'm the person that you want in there. The problem with that though, was that you get addicted to that adrenaline, right? And you're constantly busy. And if you don't have enough on your plate, you start to bake the sourdough or you start to cloth diaper. Cloth diapering was actually, I'm not going to knock that. It's pretty awesome. (laughs) It was only a little bit of extra work for such a huge reward. But making your own baby food, (laughs) come on. (laughs) It's just ridiculous. I feel like there are some people who do that, but not people who work 60 hours a week. We totally venerate busyness. It's a mark yes. of pride, right? Oh, I'm too busy. 100%. Yeah. 
And I love what you're saying. Love 100%. it. hundred percent. And we need to stop. And I feel like where, where we don't stop is the self-reflection. So coming full circle, Dave, I realized I went on a bit of a tangent there, but one of the things that helped me so much and why my personality has changed is because I've spent a lot of time drinking my own Kool-Aid. Right? <laughs> I tell people to slow down. The universe slowed me down to like dead stop. <laughs> right? And then what else did I have to do at that point? You can complain about your situation or you can use the tools that you earned in your last life and try and make a plan for yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's the soldier in the hole. I was my own soldier in the hole because I've been in a hole like this before, not this deep, but I know how I got out of other holes. I know how I rehabilitated myself this time. I stayed down in the hole a little bit longer to speak to the soldier version of myself to help me to understand why I keep falling in the stinking hole. And once we had that conversation and understood, now I get it. So your soldier was a self-reflection. My soldier was a self-reflection. Yeah. I had to get real with myself and say, this isn't about accepting guilt because you caught cancer. No, that's not what I'm telling you to do. But you have to say, how did my lifestyle play a part in this? You got to get real. Where have you been baking all the cookies when you could have just bought some and put them on a plate and been like, bam, I'm out. You know? yeah. <laughs> With the PTA and all that stuff. Where was the time that you could have just been like, yeah, that's not for me. I have learned to ask myself first. And I use like this little four part system where I ask, how do I feel today? And I listen, feel my body like, oh, that hip is a little achy and my back's a bit sore here today. I can't see really well or whatever, go through. Then I reflect, okay, so if I'm feeling this way, what's gonna be the best thing for me to do? Am I going to lie in bed? Am I going to get up and go meditate? Should I go on the treadmill? Maybe I should do some Pilates and stretch and open all this up. What should I do? And then I choose powerfully. And I do that before I get out of the bed. Because I am the master of my life. Invictus, Jackie, I am. <laughs> right? We learned that poem and it stuck with me so bad right? I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. So when I get out of bed in the morning, I choose powerfully about how I'm going to move through that day. I set the course. I love it. I love that poem. Please, if anybody uh, okay. is listening, read the poem in uh, Invictus. It'll read it carefully and powerfully and thoughtfully. It will change your life. Literally. Yeah. Yeah. Literally, I learned so much from being a part of those games. So much that I learned from being a part of those games, I've utilized for myself now, even if it's just um, the company I use to get my assisted devices. Because I knew from working at the games where we got ours. So it was like, oh, sweet. I'm just going to call them up and see what I can do. So there's so many different things from my old life that have been very helpful for me. This is amazing. I'm sitting here in my, my, you know, the gears are turning in my brain. I'm thinking, okay, a year and a half ago, um, like I, I'm one of those people where I, I feel like I do enjoy being busy and maybe I do need to sit and kind of reflect. And this past year and a half has really forced me to do that, forced me to slow down. Yeah. You know, all the things that I'm usually involved in were just not happening. Um, so before this, I had my son in T-ball. I had my son in lacrosse. He was in swimming lessons, um, you know, and then COVID happens and he can't do any team sports, but I still wanted to get him involved in something. So I signed him up for a yoga class and he loved it. Awesome. Um, and I think that it was the best thing that I signed him up for, you know, and um, definitely the best timing for it too, because it really taught him um, in his young body to just calm yes. just calm your body figure out how to deal with yourself and 
um, all of that. So you have mentioned earlier that you have two younger boys um, who are pretty active. And I know sports has played a huge role in your life. So what lessons from sport did you learn as an athlete that you want to pass along to your boys? Um, the number one thing I think I learned from sports is discipline. And when I say discipline, it's not in a, um, a punishment way. It's a becoming a disciple of yourself. Really, that's what discipline means, right? And so being in situations that suck so bad and having the resilience to have to stay there, right? Like you're losing by a lot against a team that's bigger than you and you're getting smashed into the ground, but the, and you're like, please, what time is it? Blow the whistle. <laughs> I've only been in that situation a thousand times and I'm like, oh my gosh, why did I pick rugby? As a <laughs> you were even basketball when your lungs are like burning and you're kind of looking at your coach, but they're not getting the message that you need off. <laughs> you're just like, oh. I want my kids to be able to have those situations and stay in the game, right? I want my kids to have that little bit of resilience because there is a lot of suck in your life. And uh, that's another reason. I know that people, there was that military guy who did this thing about why you should make the bed. And the reason my mom told us why we should make the bed was because you need to learn that there's things in life that you don't like to do but sometimes you've got to do it. And there anything that you're going to do, you might as well do well, right? And so I think that those are two things that happen in sports. The team aspect of it is just so amazing to be with a group of people going through a collective experience when you know you're on the field and it sucks and you look over at your teammate and you're both like, why? <laughs> but you're just like instantly there. And when the night's over, you laugh about it. Cause you're like, Oh my gosh, do you remember that time? Fletcher's fields was so dry and we got so many rocks. Oh my God. Remember that? Those are always the best stories. When you get together with your old sports friends, <laughs> you just remember the time where you, it sucked so bad. <laughs> but yes, I mean, my girls right now, um, my Field Hockey Canada indoor women right now are at IPAC, which is um, a big tournament in Pennsylvania, and I can't be there with them, and that sucks. But I did record a video for them and made some jokes. <laughs> but I love the videos that they're posting, and they're driving in the car together, and they're singing, and that's what I want for my kids. I want them to feel that. I want them to feel nervous before they play a sport so that when they have to do a speech or when they have to do a job interview, they've been through that. They know the feeling and they know what to do. I can take these deep breaths. I can calm myself, mm -hmm. right? I can go out there or I might need to do a jog around the block or something to let out some energy and then I'm good. They learn how to soothe themselves through sport too, right? It's, it's funny because... <laughs> It's funny because you're mentioning a lot of things that I don't even realize that I learned from sports um, that are totally like just natural part of practice in my life. Mm -hmm. Kind of like how to push through, how to prepare, how to avoid, you know, um, frustration or how to work through frustration. It's, it's great. I love everything that you're bringing up. And I'm so glad that I also have that background as well to kind of push through. Right. It's like, you know, not to eat SpaghettiOs right before you have to go to practice. You, you only learn that from eating the SpaghettiOs yeah. and going to practice. You're like, oh my God. But that tells you for the rest of your life, when I've got an event where I've got to be physical, I don't eat this way. I eat this way. It's little things like that that you don't think that you picked up from sports, right? It teaches you about the metaphysical because everyone is superstitious. Why are you superstitious, I think, right? I think people, uh, like teammates, let you make that SpaghettiO mistake once. Yeah. Because everybody wants to watch what SpaghettiOs look like afterwards, right? <laughs> Everyone on the team's like, yo, check this out. This is, yeah. It's going to go down bad right now. 
<laughs> it's always the way. It's yeah. always the way. And I feel like there's so many little things like checking what the grass is like before deciding what cleats to wear. It's little things of self-awareness that you're putting yourself into a situation. And I'm sure you guys know, like I feel of sports is sort of a meditation. You can't be in the game and thinking about a lot of other stuff. You have to be in the game and you have to be in the game. And so it becomes this moving meditation where you are uniquely present in that moment. And honestly, I think that's also what I loved about being an athletic therapist. When you're standing on the bench at these games, you're not necessarily watching to see someone score. You're watching to see before and after injuries. So you're looking at it through a completely different lens, but it keeps you so dialed in that it the time goes quickly and it just feels like you're in the flow, right? So that's another great thing about just being a therapist and watching sports, let alone playing sports. So as a type one diabetic, I know that food can play a short game and a long game uh, when it comes to impact on your life. Have you, with through your journey, have you noticed anything like that? Something that may cause a flare up or may cause something or, you know, in a situation, something that could uh, do the opposite of calming you down. Have you picked up anything like that? Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, um, one of the things in the African work that I'm doing right now, they talk a lot about floral essences, right? And so you're talking about chamomile or lavender and like utilizing them in an olfactory sense, but also drinking different types of teas, right? That can support. So dandelion, for example, not a delicious tea, a little bit bitter, but kind of like a green tea, right? A little grassy. Great for detoxing, right? This is stuff that you learn from working with a naturopath, but these are also things that you, food is medicine. Like I said, my best friend is a huge <laughs> food advocate, and she actually does research. Her research is on like social justice and food. So she is the chef that went into the hospitals and revamped their entire food systems to tell them that they can eat fresh local food instead of giving people green jello when they're sick, right? There's a way that we can make jello in a way that is healthy and nutritious and beautiful so that when you're in the hospital, you're actually healing, right? This is my best friend's book. <laughs> so obviously her influence about food has rubbed off on me. But yes, I've had food sensitivity tests. I'm allergic to um, nuts. I have anaphylaxis. So um, because I have lesions in my stomach as well, they thought for a while it could be celiac. So we had to do some examinations into that as well. So there are definitely things that I can't eat that I love like tomatoes. Oh, can't do it, man. Just red wine we broke up, we broke up. So obviously I follow a more autoimmune protocol diet. So um, very low on the grains per se, lots and lots of vegetables. It's not like a carbohydrate mix, it's more grains. I can eat some beans and stuff like that. And I can also eat some rice, which isn't really allowed, but it doesn't flare me up. So I'm fine with that. But it has been very... Um, like a lot of exploration. But one of my other best friends is a nutritionist here in town whose name's Mel Grime. And when I first got sick, she like was like, girl, she just came with the food. This is what you're eating. This is how it's going to be. She had the recipes for me. She has um, struggled with autoimmune things as well. So she had a whole template. So food has been a huge part of my journey. Um, hands down, food is medicine and should be respected as such. And depending on your doctor, in the biopsychosocial field, this is where we're talking about with you, like where we have difficulties, like they don't even talk about this. But clearly we know the nutrients that you're eating in your food have been well documented and researched, but some of them won't even suggest, hey, do you wanna to talk to our dietitian? Why not? Right? Yeah. 
it's such a huge piece and we have to admire everything that goes into our mouth should be eaten with reverence and gratefulness and thankfulness because it should also be nourishing you. But chips are also good. <laughs> I, I, Amanda, I can't break up with my coffee. That is one thing that you we can't. Um, I can't. You don't need to. It's high in antioxidants, so you're you're fine. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> Amanda, we can't thank you enough for sharing your personal journey. I've you've reiterated a lot of what's been said on other podcasts. You know, your passion always comes through. Um, FYI, the students love Amanda, by the way. And, and I, I love that. Amanda, and it's <laughs> obvious to see why. Um, you have such a strength of character that transcends you. I, I love quotes and one of my favorite quotes is uh, education is the key to immortality. You are immortal. And I really feel like, you know, again, I love the soldier and the whole thing. Um, I really feel that's a key to your immortality. It might be a little bit of a different path, but mm -hmm. you know, the education and yeah. Um, you and I talk a lot about spirituality. I had no idea you had a minor in religious studies. I had no <laughs> idea. Um, can you elaborate on how your yeah. spirituality has impacted you and helped you on your health journey as well? Well, you know, I feel like throughout my entire life, I grew up as an Anglican. And so um, I was an altar girl carrying the cross on Sundays and the whole thing. I went to like youth group and everything like that, which was just one of the sides of me. Yes, I was a jock and played a lot of sports and did all this stuff. And yes, I was in band and drama, but I also had this spiritual aspect and I had the best minister growing up. And so my first minister that I dealt with, Father David, was very sacred. Everything he did and touched felt sacred. Like he just felt really holy. I don't know how to explain it. But as a kid, I was just like, you're standing in the light of this guy who's just like, awesome. Right. And when he left our church, we were all distressed. And through a few ministers, we ended up getting this guy, Father, um, Father Greg, and he was young. And Father Greg was so open to like, everything that was hip, right? Like he was so cool. And the way that he would explain things in his homily resonated with all of us, like teenager-ish level. And you could ask him anything and talk to him about anything. He's now a bishop out in BC, but he started with us. We were like his first church. And so he was just bringing that realness that just kind of hit you every time. And so I feel like, a lot of people didn't realize that was a part of my life. But when I went to university, uh, it was something that I still wanted to explore, right? And so some of my favorite classes were um, Evil and Its Myths was one of my absolute favorites. And it was looking at the dark side and the evil and how things progress like that and what is evil really as a social construct. And so as I'm sitting here going through this shadow work, having that experience with evil in its myths helps me to realize this dark side that I'm in right now or was in is just part of it. It has to be there. It's not about banishing the light. It's about, you know, holding it back, right? You don't want to hold, you don't want to banish all the darkness. You want to hold it back a little bit. You totally can't experience happiness until you experience sadness. They, right? they are hand in hand. So yeah, the first time I was able to go on a bike ride with, well, I was on a scooter. My scooter's name is Cherry Bomb. She's super cool. She goes eight kilometers an hour. You're welcome. And so <laughs> I'm trying to keep up with my kids. We're at a provincial park. They're driving, driving, and I'm like scooting behind them like me and the wind is blowing in my hair. And I just started singing. <laughs> I was like, so happy that I could get off of the campsite and I had this freedom that my scooter was allowing me to be a part of my family again right and so I was just so thankful for that moment and yeah I wouldn't have had a moment like that if I didn't have a if I never needed a, to use a scooter 
until you realize what it's like to be trapped at home. And then you finally can go to Starbucks in your little scooter and get your own coffee. And it's like, <laughs> you get dressed up <laughs> to go to Starbucks. <laughs> ah, so funny. But those are the things that I have, when I say my personality has shifted and changed, I find so much joy in those things. And it, so, it sounds so sim simple because I'm just so much more aware, right? I'm just so much more, I don't have 80 things going on in my mind at any given time. If I'm sitting out by my pond, I'm just listening to the water and looking at the way the leaves go in the trees and having some gratitude for some of the things that are around me. I, I love it, Amanda. I, again, I've learned a lot. And one of the things I love about doing these podcasts is I take away stuff and I reflect on it. Um, I, again, I can't thank you enough. You've shared so many pearls of wisdom that certainly has allowed me to reflect and will give me an opportunity to ponder. Um, so thank you. I, I, I thank you. Truly, I do. You're welcome. Um, thank you for having me. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been an such absolute an pleasure. Awesome, it has been an awesome experience. I love talking to you guys. Thank you so much for the invite. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda has obviously had a tough journey, but her positivity has always shone through. And she's learned some great personal lessons, which I'm certainly taking home for myself as well. Um, it's been a super tough year with the pandemic. And um, you know, how it's impacted our lives, which can bring us up, which can bring us down. And, you know, sometimes we focus on the negative. Uh, I'd like to be positive and I'd like to be, you know, the glasses half full kind of girl, but sometimes I'm not. I'm really curious about how each of you have been able to be positive throughout this pandemic. And if you haven't, how has it impacted your food and fitness goals? So Dave, can you share with us some things that you've been able to do to be positive. And if you can't, you know, by all means share with us. And if that has impacted your food and fitness goals. It's actually really funny because food and fitness have been part of the reason of how I stay positive. Um, so uh, if, I don't know if you can see, but most of this shelf over here is all cookbooks. So I just kind of read through those um, and uh, look through them on a regular basis and, Making stuff uh, is very interesting to me, keeps me, I guess, focused, but distracted at the same time. Um, same with going out for walks and hikes. I mean, it's a great opportunity for me to kind of just unplug or um, feel good about everything, even though if I may go into it uh, with a negative attitude, I usually come out with it with a positive one, which is always nice. Um, I'm, I'm usually pretty happy-go-lucky kind of guy. So for me, it's been a great opportunity to be okay on my own um because for a while we uh i wasn't working uh, which is totally fine um but i started reading never used to do that before uh high school is not a place where i read and even though we had to do book reports didn't succeed at those um but now i've been reading new stuff that i'm super interested in i'm reading great new topics a lot of it is food related uh some of it's fitness related um and talked about uh read some books about uh black issues read some books about indigenous issues and it was a great opportunity for me to learn and educate myself and that's where i think i i thrive sometimes so it's that's great awesome. for me so you're not just surviving you're thriving during the pandemic i'm trying to that's awesome that's awesome just how about you you know I've been taking everything day by day, but I feel like in general, I'm a lot like Dave. I'm a pretty positive person on most days. Um, you know, there has been some struggles throughout the, the pandemic. For me, the biggest thing is that I'm so family centered. I love being around family. And one of the things that I couldn't do this year was see my grandparents. So my grandparents, um, most of my life, they would spend six months down in Florida and then six months up here. So, you know, it's it's nice when they're around to actually be able to see them. Um, so this year, definitely couldn't do that. And my at the start of the pandemic, my grandparents were not online. They're not very um, tech savvy. I'm definitely the one that they call. It's like, hey, my computer's not turning on. How do I turn it on? It's like, oh, you press the button in the top right. 
So um, they have come a long way and it's been amazing to actually be able to FaceTime and spend more time with them. So I think it's just every day finding something new that m- brings you joy. Um, and we talked in this podcast today about keeping busy and making sourdough bread. So there was definitely, I didn't do sour br- sourdough, um, but we had bread competitions with my family. So we would do, um, like, let's say one time it was, okay, let's try to make bread without yeast. So we had three different breads. One ended up getting thrown in the garbage before anyone got to test it. Um, but we, ha- we ended up finding two amazing recipes without using yeast. So um, just finding something new and something that we wouldn't have done before. For me, like it it does come back to to food and family and fitness. Um, Those are the three things that do bring me a lot of joy. Um, Obviously I love my, I love work and I love everything else, but those are the three things that bring me joy. Um, So I've really tried to focus on that and just new ways and different ways and um, just trying to keep things exciting around that. Um, so it overall, it has impacted my, the food and fitness goals that we've set out, but I think in a, in a more positive way than negative. Um, so yeah, Jackie, what about you? Yeah, we've had to, the pandemic has taught me a lot. I, I think like you guys, maybe that's why we gel so well. I tend to be a pretty positive person. I always try and look at the, the, the happy side of things and, and regularly, I say we are so blessed in all that we have. Um, So that's something that I remind myself. And, you know, Amanda talked about gratitude and I'm grateful for what I have. And I'm grateful for the health, like we pray uh, as a family. And these are things that I, you know, in our prayer, I'm like, I'm just so grateful for what uh, we've been given and the ta- the fact that we're healthy and, you know, that type of stuff. It, it is a roller coaster. Um, you know, I, I do, I, I, although I'm an introvert, I get my joy from being with others. And that's been a little bit of a struggle because, you know, my family's awesome. Um, and I love my family, but during the day we go to our own rooms and, you know, I sit here in front of my computer a lot by myself. So that's been a little bit of a struggle. But every day I wake up and I tell my son, I'm like, what are we going to be positive about today? And one of the things that I've leaned on, um, I like Amanda, uh, very spiritual, and I love Indigenous studies. But when I was in Arizona a few years ago, um, I found Coco Pele. And I wear Coco Pele. And Coco Pele is, um, if you don't know who Coco Pele is, it's, it's a... Um, kind of a god type thing Uh, but Coco Pele has a flute and he has a hunched back and you know he spreads joy wherever he goes I'm a musician and I like spreading joy and I try and spread joy and Coco Pele reminds me the importance of spreading joy um, to those around him so um, yeah that's kind of what brings me joy and keeps me positive yeah so Thank you to you guys for being here again. Um, Until next time. We'll talk food. We'll talk fitness. And we'll do it together. Thank you for watching and listening to this week's episode of the Food and Fitness Podcast. Join us in two weeks when we connect and chat more about food and fitness.